Okay, uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our monthly Distinguished Speaker Series sponsored by the Save Our Seas Foundation. We have a great program tonight, an expert panel on sharks uh, with uh, some leading shark scientists from around Florida and even up into New England. Uh, but before we begin, I just want to go over a few guidelines for our audience tonight. Microphones are going to remain muted throughout the presentation uh, just to keep uh, clear and efficient uh, flow going for our conversation. Uh, but feel free to type any questions you want in the chat. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation with four guest panelists. I'm sure we're going to be covering a lot of different topics. So as they're talking, you can just put all your questions in the chat. We'll save time at the end to come back and ask them and, and open up a discussion. Uh, so microphones are going to be muted, but the discussion will remain open in the chat. You can ask any questions you want, and we'll come back to them at the end. Feel free to have your cameras on if you'd like. It's always nice to see an audience when somebody's presenting, but uh, you know, you're free to your anonymity also. Um, and most importantly, uh, please join me in welcoming tonight's guests. As I said, tonight we are going to be talking about sharks. So we have a range of guests tonight who will be presenting the research across the spectrum, all of uh, different topics of sharks. I'll be starting with Dr. Dean Grubbs, PhD and Associate Director of Research at the Florida, U Florida State University Coastal and Marine Laboratory. Also, we have Dr. Stephen Kajura, Professor of Biological Scientist Sciences at Florida Atlantic University, who has worked extensively researching the evolution of hammerhead sharks and the seasonal migration of black tip sharks right off our coast here in Southeast Florida as well as Dr. Mary Ann Porter, Assistant Professor of Biological Sciences at Florida Atlantic University and the founder of the Florida Atlantic Biometrics Lab, also known as the Fab Lab, where her and her team uh, research a variety of topics, including shark skin stretchiness and the movements of sharks as they swim. We also have Dr. Gregory Scoble, uh, not, a Florida, not a Florida representative, which is special for us, He's currently the head of the Massachusetts Shark Research Program and a teacher at the University of Massachusetts School for Marine Science and Technology. Accomplished marine biologist, underwater explorer, photographer, and author, Dr. Scomel has been studying the life history, ecology, and physiology of sharks for more than 35 years. So we have a good range of experts coming through here um, to share their research with us. Uh, we're going to start it off with uh, Dr. Dean Grubbs from Florida State University, uh, who's going to be talking to us about his research up there. Uh, Dr. Grubbs, I think uh, Hillary, can we get him unmuted? And yeah, Dr. Grubbs, uh, thank you for joining us. All right, thanks, Brady. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, thanks for putting this on, and thanks to the Save Our Seas Foundation for uh, sponsoring this as well. And and thanks to Greg for being here, so that uh, I'm not the oldest person at this uh, in this panel this time. So that's that's nice. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen real quick, and hopefully you can see that now. Looks good. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take a little bit more of a broad approach and just tell you about the kind of work I do in my lab. So I am a research professor at the FSU Coastal and Marine Lab. Um, I wear kind of two hats in this uh, for, for, for uh, an event like tonight, though, because I've also for the last five years had the privilege of being a scientific advisor to the Save Our Seas Foundation, who is sponsoring, uh, sponsoring this uh, get together, this panel. So in case you don't know, uh, the FSU Coastal Marine Lab is up here in North Florida, basically up at the, uh, in the, the sort of in the beginning of the armpit of Florida there. Um, I live in Sop Choppy, which is just about 10 miles from the lab and is home to the Worm Grunting Festival. So come visit us up in, uh, in Sop Choppy whenever you want. Uh, so my research basically is in the biology, ecology, and conservation of coastal and deep sea fishes, mostly sharks and rays. And so most of the work I do is addressing questions needed specifically uh, to address gaps in, in knowledge for management of fish stocks, particularly shark stocks or conservation of, um, of imperiled species. Um, so I concentrate on species that are either exploited commercially, economically, are subject to bycatch, um, or those that are threatened or endangered. And I work both with, you know, all the state, federal, and international 
uh, groups as well as uh, environmental groups in some of the work that, that we do. And you can go to that website that was there if you, if you want to visit my lab and see what all we're up to. And so we, we look at uh, sharks and rays for that matter from, from the individual to the population level. Uh, we do a lot of work looking at how populations change over space and time. Uh, we look at life history characteristics, so how long do sharks take to reach maturity, how often do they reproduce, how many offspring do they have, those kinds of questions. We do a lot of work with tagging and telemetry to look at the types of habitats that different shark species are using and what habitats are critical to their, their ecology. And then we also look at community structure, looking at what species coexist, what species, uh, what the role each species plays in an ecosystem, those kinds of things. And then, and then of course, for species that are either, either overfished and or endangered, we also do research directly uh, associated with trying to promote recovery of those species. And so um, along those lines, we, we also do a lot of work on uh, looking to minimize bycatch and bycatch mortality. This is an article I wrote for the Save Our Seas magazine a, couple, a few years ago on mortality of sharks and rays in various fisheries. Cryptic mortality or the unseen mortality in different commercial fisheries where the sharks aren't targeted is probably the biggest threat uh, facing most shark and ray populations. Um, and even in, in those uh, fisheries that are targeting sharks, sometimes you catch species that you don't want. For example, this is a, uh, a study that we've been doing looking at post-release mortality of scalloped and great hammerhead sharks in, in uh, commercial longline fisheries in Florida waters, uh, basically trying to inform the managers and the, um, and the uh, fish, fisheries of ways they can minimize mortality. And basically all this is showing is uh, on the vertical axis is rel relative uh, stress, physiological stress in the two species of hammerhead versus the time that they're on a hook. Basically showing the less time the sharks are on the hook, uh, the higher the, the probability is that they're going to sur survive. So the work that we do is in three major regions. Uh, we do a lot of deep sea ecology work, a lot of coastal shark and ray ecology work, and then also the third area is um, on small tooth sawfish, which I'll touch on um, briefly. And so I'm just going to give you a thumbnail of some of the types of projects that we've got going on in these different realms. Uh, much of the deep sea work that we've done in recent years is in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. This is where it is. These are our standard stations that we sample in the deep sea, looking at the toxicological responses to the oil in sharks and bony fish, but also looking at their, their communities, because we really know almost nothing about the deep sea communities of fishes, including sharks in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but so we work not only with, with the big sharks, the little tiny sharks, as well as some of the big crazy uh, bony fish like this giant snake eel. Uh, we've been able to describe a couple of new species. For example, this is a new species of dogfish shark that is named after Jeannie Clark, the shark lady from Moat Marine Lab Laboratory. Uh, we named it after her, Squalus Clarky. Um, this was the first um, Greenland shark ever caught in the Gulf of Mexico. We caught it at 6,000 feet deep very close to where the uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill occurred, first one that was ever actually captured. And these are just one example, I'm not going to show you a lot of data, but one example of some data from, from this work. These are the three most common shark species in the deep water in the Gulf of Mexico, and they're distributed by at different depths. And notice this is basically the response to the most toxic components in the oils. Um, and you see that all three, they ramped up and uh, had their most, the, the highest level of response to the toxins was about three years after the spill. And so it's amazing that all three species showed the exact same patterns. The question then is, well, did that affect their populations or did they die from this? Obviously would be the question. This is our estimates of abundance of the populations of those three species. And you can see that one increased, one decreased, one was stable. That just tells us that probably the toxicological response to the oil were not sufficient enough to, to uh, uh, actually cause mortality or changes in the population, at least uh, not as of five years, six years after the spill. We also do a lot of deep sea tracking work. I can't have a talk without showing a six-kill shark because I love them. They're awesome. They've been around 200 million years, cool animals. 
And so we do a lot of work using various methods to track deep sea sharks like these blunt nose six gill sharks, which are the, the largest predatory fishes at between about 600 and 3,000 feet deep of the world, uh, the world over. Most of the time we're bringing these things onto the deck of the boat with, and tagging them or releasing them. And they are very tough. They survived this, but there's obviously some trauma associated with tagging them on the deck of the boat. So recently we were actually able to convince Ocean X uh, to work, work with them to allow us to strap spear guns to the front of a submarine that are adapted for tagging sharks. And we went down to, to the middle of the Exuma Sound in the, in the, in the Bahamas and tagged sharks with a spear gun. I'll show you a video link you can look at to, if you want to see that later. But these are just a couple of images of six gill sharks we we're trying to tag from the, from the submarine, which is pretty cool. In the coastal zone, we do a lot of work looking at abundance trends, again, food webs, life histories, and those kinds of things, working primarily in the Big Bend region of Florida up here. Um, and so we do this, what's called a fishery independent survey using gill nets and long lines uh, across this whole area every year. We've been doing it for, for 12 years. We tag about a thousand sharks uh, a year from 12 species in this, in this survey. And so one of the reasons we do this is these data go directly into assessments of the population done by the federal government. And so for example, this just shows you trends and abundance of sharp nose sharks and, and bonnet head sharks. It includes our data over time. And this is from one of the stock assessments. And basically this shows you that bonnet head shark populations are stable. Uh, at, at this point, sharp nose shark populations were increasing slightly. And so we do this for all of the different shark species in Florida waters to see what their population trends are doing. We also do a lot of trophic ecology, so food webs. How do sharks fit into the food webs? You've probably heard sharks referred to as apex predators. In truth, most sharks are not apex predators. Now, maybe these sharks with big teeth like this uh, are toward the top of their food chain, but these are all shark teeth too. And look at those. A lot of those are clearly probably not apex predators. So sharks actually fill a lot of different um, roles in marine food webs. And so this is a, a, from one of my students papers where we're looking at where sharks fit into the food web. And essentially this is a stable isotope analysis. And all you really need to know is that the higher you are on the vertical axis, the higher you are on the food chain. And then the horizontal axis just gives us an idea of what your primary carbon source is. So whether you're part of a phytoplankton based food web a seagrass-based food web, macroalgae, et cetera. But if you look at this, you see that we've got black tip sharks at the top of this food, food web. Uh, we've got sharp-nosed sharks sort of just below the black tips and then bonnet head sharks, a full trophic level below those black tips. So sharks fill a lot of different um, roles in uh, trophic niches within shark communities. This is part of a bigger study that we just published that used um, 12 different um, uh, species or more than that, I forget how many were in the, the overall thing. And it might not surprise you that in this one, in this food web, great hammerheads and bull sharks are at the top of the food chain. Black tips and tiger sharks are pretty close, but just below them. It might surprise you that this butterfly ray is at the same part of the food web as a black tip shark and a tiger shark. Crazy, right? This little silly stingray. This little silly stingray eats fish. And so it's actually a major predator. So sometimes things are uh, filled different predatory roles than we might predict. Another example, this is some work we, we did with FWC looking at the role bull sharks and sawfish, small tooth sawfish play in the, in the food web. And that's the black and the white dots here. And all I want you to notice from this is that there's complete overlap here. What that means is that sawfish and bull sharks are at the same trophic level from the time they're little tiny babies until they're adults. And so sawfish, you wouldn't think this ray with this crazy little weird mouth would be a major predator or top predator in their system, but they are. And in fact, that's a picture of me pulling a three foot sharp nose shark out of the mouth of an adult sawfish. So sawfish are major predators. 
But of course, all predators are prey too. And this is a photo from one of our papers showing that is a sawfish rostrum sticking out of the mouth of a bull shark. So sawfish get eaten too. Not only do they eat sharks, sharks eat them. This was kind of a cool thing that just, just came up uh, recently. There was a uh, swordfish uh, that died and went to the bottom and was found by a, an underwater video vehicle. And it was being scavenged by all of these sharks. Most of these sharks are that species we just described in the Gulf of Mexico, the name of Gene Clark. They're scavenging on it, but all of a sudden, so these sharks are major scavengers, but then all of a sudden this silly wreck fish, this thing that looks like a bass, came swimming up and started eating the sharks. And so it just swallowed one of the sharks whole, crazy. So predators can be prey as well. And so the last part I'll mention is that we also do a lot of work on sawfish. If you saw Tanya Wiley's uh, presentation uh, a couple few months back or a couple weeks back, whenever it was, she probably talked about some of our work. And so we've been doing work on uh, small tooth sawfish, which was the first native marine fish ever listed as, the, as endangered in the United States. Um, and so we're basically looking at differences between populations in the US and the Bahamas, because those are the only viable populations that we, we know about. Um, and so we're working primarily on these, uh, on the island of Andros and in, the, um, and in Southwest Florida, mostly in protected areas. National parks seem to be one of the reasons we still have sawfish in these two countries is because a lot of their habitat is under protection through national parks and national protected areas. Um, some of the highlights that we've found so far, we actually found some places where we think sawfish are mating in, um, in Florida, which is cool. These are sawfish with mating scars from getting uh, whacked by that sawed rostrum when they're trying to uh, reproduce, trying to copulate. Um, we also observed the first ever live birth of sawfish in the wild anywhere in the world. And this also confirmed the sawfish do give birth in Florida really cool. There's some cool videos on my website of the sawfish giving birth. If you want to see it, go to my website. It's really cool stuff. Um, and then my student Jasmine, who just graduated, has been analyzing about a lot of our telemetry data. We've been implanting 10-year transmitters, transmitters that last 10 years into sawfish. And so far, they've been detected on over 500 receivers, all the way from right off of my lab. Actually, sawfish we tagged in Key West showed up right in my back doorstep up here in North Florida, all the way up to Georgia. But what we've been doing is looking at where are the hot spots of movements for adult sawfish. And so this is females and males. And you see the males travel a little bit farther than the females, but it's really the Florida Keys, the Caloosahatchee River, Charlotte Harbor area, Cape Canaveral and Everglades National Park. Those are really the hot spots for um, primary critical habitat, it looks like for adult sawfish. And so we're taking those data now and overlapping them with fishery data where commercial gillnet, shrimp trawl, and longline fisheries are fishing to try to figure out where's the highest risk that a sawfish might die by being caught as bycatch in a fishery so that we can inform the managers of ways to minimize uh, capture of this endangered species. That's all I'm going to tell you. I know that was a lot really quick, but we've got a lot to get through. Um, I do want to point out, I usually put videos in these talks, but, you know, I didn't figure they'd work very well in Zoom. So there's links here uh, to uh, documentaries that you can watch for free. Changing Seas down in South Florida did these two, one on saw our sawfish work, one on our deep sea oil spill research. There's also a PBS documentary you can watch for free, or their Journey to Planet Earth series that highlights our deep sea work. If you go to this National Geographic site, you can see some really crazy footage of big blunt nose six gill sharks from the submarine and us trying to tag them from a submarine and the sub just getting pushed all over the bottom of the ocean, terrifying. And then the last thing I'll mention is I got a book out. So I've got to hawk that real quick. And uh, so if you're interested in sharks, this book was written for both shark enthusiasts as well as you know students and educators and um, it's by Johns Hopkins University Press. And if you act now, Cyber Week, up through Monday, you can, or Sunday, 40% off, you can pick up this gem of a book for uh, like 37 bucks or something. So that's it. Hopefully I was under 15 minutes. Wow, yeah, just about, that was uh, fascinating stuff and quite a, quite a sales pitch. Uh, <laughs> I was, I, I'm definitely inclined to check out uh, some of those videos and stuff. Uh, 
uh, uh, amazing images coming through the presentation and just uh, thinking about just even the diversity of deep sea sharks in the Gulf of Mexico that we don't even think of as that big is uh, you know, pr pretty astonishing to think about. So thank you to Dr. Grubbs. We'll be holding our questions for the end of the presentation uh, and coming back to our experts. Uh, a lot of cool stuff to talk about there. And I know there's gonna be a lot of cool stuff to talk about coming up next. We have Dr. Stephen Kajura of Florida Atlantic University uh, and a, a frequent friend of some of our camp programs at the museum. Dr. Kajira, it's great to see you again, albeit virtually, uh, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, great, thank you, Brady, and uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, come and talk to you guys today. Appreciate that, and thanks to uh, Save Our Seas Foundation for uh, sponsoring this. Also put in a plug for Dean's book, good book. I, I thought it was a great book, Dean, so yeah. Go get it, it's well worth it. <laughs> All right, so what I wanna talk about today is just a little bit of the stuff that we've been doing down here in South Florida for the past decade or so, uh, right off right off our uh, our beaches here in, uh, in the Southeast from Palm Beach uh, County, basically down to Miami. Um, and so I'm gonna try starting this screen share. Let me see if I can get this to go like that. Share and do that. All right. So just to confirm, do you see like a, a whole? Yeah. This uh, is a, a yeah. This is the this is the view we're looking for. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk about uh, these uh, these black tip sharks that come down and visit us every winter, and they come down by the thousands. You can see just from this uh, frame alone, uh, this little video alone, all those little wiggly dots. Those are all sharks shot from uh, a drone in this case. And what happens is uh, when these sharks come down here, they come quite close to the beach. I'm not sure if you can see my little cursor here, but uh, here you've got some people standing on the beach right here, looking out at the water, looking out at the hundreds of sharks in the water right off the beach where they were about to go swimming. Um, and you can walk along the beach like this guy, and you can walk along and literally see the sharks. One, two, three, four, five, all these sharks right there, uh, very close to where these, uh, uh, the beachgoers are, uh, are enjoying the, uh, the water. And even you know, some of the houses here. I mean, these are people who have nice houses right on the uh, ocean and they have sharks right in their backyard. Look at that, hundreds of them right there. So you know, wouldn't it be great to live in one of these houses and walk out and, and have sharks in your backyard? I mean, I would love that. I would love to have one of these houses. Um, maybe these owners aren't quite as impressed by having all these sharks here, but I would like it. And, and so what happens is I get calls every year about what's happening with all these sharks. What's going on? Why are there so many sharks here? Should we be concerned? You know, they're right in my backyard. And uh, I have to field these uh, calls and media inquiries every year and tell people that these are uh, black tip sharks. Uh, they come down here every winter. Uh, they spend the, uh, the winter down here and um, then they start to move back up north in, uh, in the spring. And that's, that's the typical story that I've been telling people for you know, a decade or more now. But what happened was I found that there was actually remarkably little that was known about the migration of these black tip sharks in the scientific literature. Scientists, you know, we knew what happened, but there wasn't, there wasn't that much information out there. And so to actually better inform the public and to you know, collect actual useful scientific data, uh, we had the opportunity to start to count the sharks by using an aerial survey. I figured since it was the news helicopters that kept getting all this footage and, and sharing it with me, maybe I could take advantage of that and study the sharks from the sky. And so what we've been doing is taking an airplane, a Cessna 172, we fly it along the beach at about a 500 foot altitude, uh, about 70 knots um, over, the, uh, over the water. And we mount a high definition video camera out the window and a still camera. And it records, this records the whole transect. And as we fly along from uh, initially just covering Palm Beach County from Boca up to Jupiter, and then subsequently we've now been going all the way from Miami up to Jupiter covering the, uh, the whole uh, Tri-County area and counting the numbers of sharks. It's re continuously recording as we, uh, as we go along here. So this is sort of the cartoon view of what you'd see. You can see the, uh, the airplane up here, here's the beach, there's an umbrella, you know, here's all the sharks in the water. And what those cameras are doing, they're aiming down outside the window of the plane, aiming straight down, and they're sort of capturing a field of view from the beach to about 200 meters offshore. So think of it this way, football field's 100 yards, right? 
So we've got about two football field lengths. And so we're focusing on this, this stretch adjacent to the beach because that's where the, the people are. We want to see how many sharks were where the people are. And we, there's more out here. We know there's more, but we're just concentrating on the ones uh, close to shore here. And so as we're doing this, the nice thing is the water down here in South Florida is pretty clear. We've got a nice sandy sea floor. Uh, so the sharks stand out and it's pretty shallow. Um, it's no more than about four meters deep at the most along this whole transect. And so the nice thing is we're able to see all the way to the bottom, we're able to see the sharks and know that uh, what we're seeing is actually, or, or uh, you know, we're actually seeing everything that's there. We're not missing anything. And so just to give you an idea of what this actually looks like from the, from the camera as we're doing these sorts of aerial surveys, um, this is just a single frame from the video camera um, along the beach. And this is just showing there's the tire on the airplane and there's the, uh, there's the beach, right? There's the sand and there's the strut. And every one of those black dots in there is an individual shark, all right? And so if you were to take a guess, how many sharks are you seeing there in frame? And remember, we're traveling at like 70 knots. So you've got about one or two seconds to tell me. Go, one, two, stop. How many sharks were there? Well, you can type it in the chat and see how close you guys got. Um, there were in that frame, if you sat there and counted, 1,678 individuals. So obviously we can't count that in real time. That's why we have to video record it, take the video back to the lab and analyze it frame by frame, you know, go through it slowly. I mean, <laughs> I have the student go through it slowly. I'm not going to do it. Um, I have the student go through it slowly and actually count the, uh, the sharks for us. But just to give you an idea of what this looks like, and I hope this video runs, it's just a 30 second clip to show you um, what the, uh, what the aerial survey will look like. So as we're flying along, the camera's mounted out the window, looking down, and you can see the, the beach on the side there, um, and all those little dots that you see as we're flying along, every one of those is, uh, is a shark. And as we keep going here, you can see that there are literally thousands of sharks, and it just keeps going. There's, you know, there's a huge mass of, of sharks, and then there's a boat, there's more sharks, it just keeps going and going and going. Um, and you get the idea that you have huge numbers of sharks. And remember, this is close to the beach. That's no more than a couple football fields away from the, uh, the shore here. And in fact, just to give you an idea, as you stop here, there's A1A, there's the road, right? You can literally drive along the road here and, and look out the car window and see the sharks in the water. That's how, that's how close they are. So what we're interested in doing is looking at how many sharks are here, but also when are they here? And so to do that, we've been uh, counting the sharks and we see that you have peak numbers of sharks, huge numbers of sharks in the winter time, January, February, March, and it drops off precipitously to hardly anything throughout the rest of the year. Then a big jump again in the winter time and it drops off. And so you've got these annual peaks in abundance. And uh, we've been doing this since 2011 through, well, I don't have my 2020 data on here apparently. Um, but uh, if you look and overlay the water temperature, you can see that this is water temperature now, showing you got seasonal peaks in the wintertime, the water's colder and then it warms up and it's hot in the summer and then it cools off, right? And so you're getting this sort of inverse relationship, lots of sharks when the temperature is low. When the temperature is high, there's very few sharks. So you got this sort of inverse relationship between shark abundance and uh, water temperature. And in fact, if you look at it, what's been interesting is if you look at the average water temperature, for the past decade, the average water temperature uh, in January through April has been climbing. Uh, and it's climbed from about uh, 23, on average, about 23 and a half to uh, about 24, more than 24 and a half. So it's all more than a full degree Celsius increase in water temperature over the past decade. And so if temperature goes up, what does that mean to the shark numbers? They go down. And sure enough, if you look at the peak shark abundance, over time, over that same time period. You can see that as temperature has been going up, the numbers of uh, sharks we've been seeing has been going down, down, down. And in fact, this year, January through April, 2020, was the lowest number of sharks we've ever seen. When I started this, we would see an excess of 12,000 sharks on a flight. Uh, this year, we didn't even break 2,000 on a flight. So the numbers have been uh, declining uh, steadily. So what does this mean in the grand scheme of things, right? If, if sharks are so dependent on water temperature and the oceans keep warming, what's going to happen? Well, we wanted to look at what the sharks were doing after they left South Florida. 
And to do that, we started to incorporate satellite transmitters. So you'd catch a shark, you'd bring it up beside the boat, you'd affix a, a transmitter to the, uh, to the dorsal fin. There's my student, Beth, leaning over and uh, affixing a, a transmitter on the fin of this shark. And what this does is every time that fin breaks the surface of the water, it reports the location, the GPS location to an orbiting satellite. And not only does it give location, it also gives temperature. And so what this enables us to do is track the movements of these animals. So this shark's, in this example, uh, was tagged off uh, of uh, Palm Beach here in, in uh, 2017. And you can see that it was detected all along the coast as it migrated north up to about Cape Hatteras, North Carolina by, by June of that year. I should have shown one of my 2020 slides, but uh, we've got more, more data um, going uh, uh, much farther, in fact. But what this shows is that it's also reporting not only location, but also temperature. And these sharks are really sort of uh, very fixed on a narrow temperature band. And you find you know, uh, these sharks half the time, approximately half their time is spent between 22 and 23 Celsius, one degree. Most of their time is spent there. In fact, if you sum these first three bars, it's over 80% of their time is spent in this very narrow three degree band. So these sharks really like this preferred 22 to 25 uh, degree temperature range. And so, as I said, we know that the oceans are warming. And if you look at the historic range of these uh, black tip sharks, they've traditionally been found, reported in the literature at least, from South Florida up to about Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. What we're seeing now is that their uh, current range is actually extending even farther. Um, this year, I had sharks reporting off Montauk, off the tip of, uh, of uh, Long Island, New York here, right? And um, they're no longer just stopping here. They're actually going farther and farther. And it's because they're following this preferred temperature, which is found at higher and higher latitudes now. And since their preferred temperature is found at higher and higher latitudes, they're actually shifting their distribution north. And in the winter times, they might not be coming quite as far south either. So uh, if we have a particularly warm winter, we don't see as many sharks coming this far south. If you migrate down and you find nice warm water off you know, Cape Canaveral, you'll just stop there. Why bother swimming all the way down to you know, Miami uh, if you have your preferred temperature uh, farther north? And so we're, we might be seeing this sort of you know, long-term distributional shift in uh, the range of these animals. And it's, it's going to be interesting. It's an exciting time to be a biologist and uh, actually have an opportunity to, to study this sort of, sort of real-time change in the, uh, the distribution of these animals. Well, I'm going to keep it real short, and I'm going to uh, stop here, and I'm going to acknowledge the Colgan Foundation. They've been uh, funding a lot of our work on, uh, on this recently. And I also encourage you to follow us on um, Twitter or Instagram. We're at, at Shark Migration or uh, check out our, uh, our Facebook page, FAU Shark Migration. And so with that, I'm going to quit this, I think, stop the share and go back to you. Wow. Uh, well, th thank you for that. Again, like more, I'm always blown away by the footage of your aerial surveys. It's just <laughs> like I, I tell people about it every time I'm at the beach, they're like, no way, no way, no way. I'm like, no, you're really. Uh, so thank you again for, for uh, sharing that. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, we haven't been able to have you around as much this year, so it's, it's good to see you and your research again. And, uh, you know, just to kind of clarify those peak numbers of sharks being right off the beach is coming up right here in the winter, right? Oh, sorry, he <laughs> muted again. So, okay. So we're, <laughs> we're yeah, going sorry to- about that. Yeah, so I was yeah. just gonna say, it's just about that time, you know, we're, we're getting ready right now. We're getting all our gear together and uh, we're looking forward to uh, start our fishing in January. I'm starting the first aerial survey of the season on Monday, in fact. So we fly every week from December until the end of April. Excellent. Well, uh, we'll keep our eye on the sky looking for you and uh, everybody else have fun at the beach. Uh, so we're gonna turn it to Dr. Marianne Porter, another uh, frequent friend of our Ocean Explorers Camp at the Museum of Discovery and Science uh, from Florida Atlantic University and the Fab Lab, the Florida Atlantic Biometrics Lab. So I see she's already sharing her screen, looking for her video here, is she unmuted? There she is. All right, uh, yeah, Dr. Porter, just, great to see you to again. See you. And excellent guess in the chat at the number of sharks in Dr. Kishira's survey picture. Yeah, I really think he needs to update that slide to a number I haven't seen before, a thousand. <laughs> in 
1,678 times. <laughs> Great. So thank you so much for having me. And I'm excited to talk to you all about swiftly swimming sharks. Um, my work has been supported by the Save Our Seas Foundation. They were instrumental in getting some of my early work at FAU started. And that work has actually been leveraged and expanded and now my lab's funded for the next five years by the National Science Foundation. And so what we do is we're the fab lab, the Florida Atlantic Biomechanics Lab. And so biomechanics means we use engineering and physics to think about how animals move. And it turns out humans are really interested in how animals are put together and how they work and how they move. So you may have heard of these guys. Aristotle, Giovanni Borelli, Leonardo da Vinci, they've been drawing humans and animals and trying to understand how the living world works and move for a really long time. Like Aristotle wrote a book on the movement of animals and you know he was around and doing stuff uh, 300 BC. So we've been really interested in how animals work for a long time. It's just something humans are excited about. So. I don't know if you guys, can you guys see me or can you just see, can you just see my slides? Uh, I can see both. Oh, like you can see my presentation? I'm looking at your uh, PowerPoint and uh, your, your video is up in the corner there. Okay, okay. <laughs> I had some different screens up that was a little weird. Okay, so like I said, my work is now funded by the National Science Foundation and we're really interested in how sharks work. So we like to think about how their skeletons are put together, how their skin works, um, how stretchy it is and how it kind of holds the shark together like a big balloon as it's swimming around through the water and how sharks swim around um, and how that varies by different species. And so today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about the cartilage and the shark swimming. So as you all know, everybody has probably uh, seen this on Shark Week or the Wild Crafts or whatever your favorite nature show is. Sharks have a cool skeleton made of cartilage. And here we have a horn shark from California. And on the left side of your screen, you can see its jaws. They're really mineralized. So that means they show up in an x-ray. And along the center of the shark is this vertebral column. And in this species, we have nice uh, spines coming out of the dorsal fin, so we can see those there. We can also see all the mineral in the skin. So this is a really great x-ray. What I'm really interested in is the vertebral column. So here we have this nice column of repeating vertebrae. And it turns out that you can spend a lot of time wiggling vertebral columns of different species back and forth to understand how different animals, different species will swim. And you might wonder, well, how can this be? And how could you be doing this for the last almost 20 years? That sounds like you could answer that in you know, a week. Well, it turns out that sharks have these really beautifully arranged um, mineral patterns in their vertebrae. And every single vertebrae in a vertebral column is working like a little spring. And so it helps the animal as it's swimming um, return elastic energy with every tail beat. And how much of this mineral you put in every little spring is going to impact how squishy your spring is. So if you've ever watched a mattress commercial, for example, they talk about the importance of the springs and how squishy your springs should be. And so Imagine that your shark vertebrae are the little springs in your mattress and how this hard part is arranged is really gonna impact how that animal is able to wiggle around and swim in the environment. And so one of my favorite mineralization patterns are found in the Makos and their relatives. They have these really cool plates. And what my lab is doing now is we're using CT imaging, so micro CT scans. And that's basically taking 3D x-rays. So if any of you have ever gone to the doctor and gotten a CAT scan of your own body, I'm able to use that same machine to get these 3D images, these CT scans of these shark vertebrae and really look at this different arrangement of mineral and understand how it works. And 
This tells me an awful lot about how sharks are able to swim. So that's basically the skeleton. But if we want to look at the really cool stuff, we go to the actual animal. And uh, unlike Dr. Grubbs, I like to live on the edge and put a lot of videos in my presentation. So here's hoping. Um, here we can see some little hammerheads swimming around in a tank. And this is the way I've been able to do a lot of work in my lab is by looking at overhead video of these sharks swimming. And in these particular sharks, one of the cool things we were able to show is the head is yawing and the tail is moving. That seems pretty, pretty obvious, right? <laughs> Just watch them. But it turns out that they're actually working at different frequencies. So the head is yawing and the tail is beating at different frequencies and they're moving at different amplitudes. So what that means is the head is going back and forth at a certain speed and moving back and forth a certain amount and the tail is doing something totally different. And so these sharks are set up as a double oscillating system. And that was really exciting for me and the researchers in my lab because We've only seen this uh, I've reported a couple of times in the literature. And so this means we're really able to start decomposing how sharks are swimming and how they're working as um, really cool uh, uh, creatures, animal machines swimming around in the world. So this is a great way to study how sharks swim. And I, I do it all the time we could stare and watch these sharks for a really long time, or at least I can, I think they're beautiful. But one of my students decided that she really needed a better view to be able to think about how these critters are using their pectoral fins. And the pectoral fins are right here. Um, my mom calls them the arm fins. And so <laughs> they're, the, they're the fins that would be equal to your arms. And so, my student was really interested in whether these sharks are able to move and change their pectoral fins as they're swimming around, in particular in maneuvering. And so what she was able to do was start studying how sharks swim in 3D. And this is something that uh, movie uh, actors have done. If you've ever seen a 3D a movie that's in 3D, um, we can see this in video game technology. Other people have studied it in different animals. But with all things marine, it becomes much more complicated as soon as you want to stick technology underwater. And so what we were able to do is use GoPro cameras. So this is a great technique that's now accessible to almost anyone in the world. Anyone who has a GoPro um, can use this, uh, this method. And we were able to start getting two views of the sharks so that we could reconstruct how they're swimming in 3D and see how they're moving this little pectoral fin. So here you can see our bonnet head shark dressed up in a bunch of dots so that we could track all those dots through space and think about how it swims. So here's a, a still picture of a spiny dogfish shark from the Pacific Ocean. And you can see what we do is we have all the dots on our shark and then we play connect the dots. So we connect all the dots to make this coordinate system that we can then track through space. And again, um, this is something that we can use uh, free open source software to analyze these data. So again, it's a really accessible technology um, to researchers around the world. So once we have our dots connected, we can start making the animations. And so here we can see our, our spiny dogfish swimming through space with its animation. It's a little hard to analyze with the shark in the background. So we can remove the shark and just have our animation. But it's, it's really hard to see what the pectoral fin is doing in particular. So then we can make our shark stand still and we can start to see how that pectoral fin is moving as these animals maneuver in space. And so far we've been able to examine two species in the lab and look at how they use their pectoral fins to maneuver. And 
basically, one of the things that a bonnet head can do is it can put its little fin on the ground and create a pivot and turn faster through its turn. And it also drops its fin a little bit, even as it is swimming normally. So if you're imagining a bonnet head swimming in the reef um, or swimming on the, the grass beds in the um, Florida Keys just south of here, this little shark can drop its little fin, maneuver really quickly to go get its prey. So this is a really great technique that we've been able to uh, innovate in my lab to look at what's going on in 3D. But this doesn't answer some big questions I have. Like, do big sharks and little sharks do the same thing? I showed you a video of tiny hammerhead sharks swimming around in the lab. Those are teeny tiny babies. But do the big hammerheads swim the same way? I have no idea. I can't put a big hammerhead in the lab. So the next thing we needed to do was to innovate ways to study sharks that were swimming out in the ocean. And so it turns out that my colleague, Dr. Kajura, um, who is also at FAU, has been talking about the black tip migration for 10 years. I've been listening to this. And he has been talking about the sharks and talking about the aerial surveys and counting all of the sharks and tagging all of the sharks. And I thought, well, how are they swimming? That's great that there are 1,600 in a frame, but what are they doing? Like, tell me more. And so what I was able to do was recruit a graduate student to fly some drones so that we can get video really similar to what we've been able to do in the lab. So my student goes out to the beach, tosses the drone up in the air, and you'll notice this figure or this photo from Dr. Kajuro's talk. You've got people on the beach. You've got sharks in the water. We've got this amazing clear water that's shallow. Um, these sharks are right here. They show up really well. So our first big question was, can we actually get good video of these sharks? And it turns out, yes, we can. So here we have sharks swimming in some really shallow water right near shore. The video is a little bit jumpy, but it is 4K video and it's very pretty normally. It's a little jumpy still here, but we can get amazing video and measure the exact same things that we did in the lab now on these sharks swimming out in the wild. And so we can put dots on the sharks and measure where they're going and get great ideas of how sharks swim by themselves. But as Dr. Kajura mentioned, these guys are also swimming in large groups. So we can start to measure how these sharks are swimming together in a really large group. And with this, we can actually model the hydrodynamics. So how the water is moving around each shark. So if you've ever been a pool with your family or your friends and someone pushes off the wall and zooms past you, you can feel that pressure. You can feel that water moving past you. And that's what happens as these sharks are swimming is they're pushing against the water and they're moving water behind them. And so the shark swimming behind the lead shark might feel some of that. And we're able to start to look at how that's happening. So now we know how these sharks are swimming by themselves, how they're swimming together, and why they might be swimming in a certain orientation with regards to how the water is flowing around them. And the last thing I wanna show you is some video shared by one of our collaborators. Oh, this is just a still picture. And so our collaborators have been able to help us get video that shows a big hammerhead shark and the black tip sharks. These are some pretty amazing chase scenes. And with this drone video, we're actually able to look at not only how a single hammerhead shark swims, like I said, how a group of hammerhead sharks swims, but now we can start to look at how predator prey interactions are happening. How does that black tip shark swim when it's got a predator nearly twice as long as it chasing it down in the shallows here. And so that's some of the, the new work we're working on in my lab. And uh, hopefully we can come back uh, next year during one of these and update you with some more information. Um, again, I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation. The Colgan Foundation funds Dr. Kajuro's lab and we obviously collaborate quite a bit. 
the Save Our Seas Foundation was a really important um, funding opportunity for me. And um, because we fly drones, we deal with the FAA and a lot of scientific studies uh, support our research. So thank you to everybody. Wow, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Porter. Uh, great to get uh, uh, where you're at with your research. I was a little different than the last time. So that was fascinating to see. And like, we're always, I think we always have like a general idea that like, oh, we've made a lot of advancements in technology. So it's naturally easier for us to learn things, but it was fascinating to get like a, uh, where the rubber meets the road of how that actually happens. So thank you uh, so much for joining us and having that research. Uh, again, we're going to be saving questions at the end. We have one more presenter. We're going to be moving all the way to Massachusetts uh, to Dr. Gregory Skomel, prolific Hello. shark scientist. Dr. Skomel, thank you for joining us, uh, the Museum of Discovery and Science annual shark panel discussion. Well, no, it's nice to be here. I, I, I guess the old guy goes last, which is not such a bad thing. Um, it's, uh, I want to thank the museum and the Save Our Seas Foundation, and it's really good to see my friends, uh, you know, Steve and, and Dean and Mary Ann. It's, it's been a while. Um, today I'm going to focus on uh, an aspect of the white shark research that we're doing up here in New England. And by the way, for those of you who are enjoying nice weather in Florida, we have a winter storm warning in effect for tomorrow, as well as a gale watch. So, uh, and I'm dressed like it's freezing and it is, it's getting cold up here. So enjoy your Florida weather. But much of what I'm gonna talk about tonight is gonna to be uh, work that has been funded by the Save Our Seas Foundation. So I really would like to acknowledge them uh, for making some of this stuff really possible. Um, all right, let's see if I can move this along in a way that, there we go. So yes, we are in New England and uh, I've circled the study area that I'm gonna focus on tonight even though we use a variety of technologies uh, that tell us where white sharks go over much broader scales. Uh, today, we're really looking at very, very fine scale behavioral information, specifically around Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And so um, what has been happening up here is really a conservation success story. I've been working for the Division of Marine Fisheries here in Massachusetts for over 30 years, uh, almost 40, I hate to admit. Uh, and when I first started, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't buy a white shark, you know, every now and then one would get entangled in nets or caught on, on long lines, but very rarely would we, they, we see them. But at the same time, we couldn't find seals. And, and, uh, and now we see a, a dramatic change in the density of seals up here as a result of conservation measures that were put in place in the early 70s. And so now anywhere we go in New England, uh, we see piles of seals. There's multiple species, but the one species that I'm focusing on are gray seals. So this is a photo taken off of Cape Cod Beach uh, here in Massachusetts just last summer, and you could see uh, high densities of seals. And when you've got this much prey, you're going to draw the, the predator, and the pr predator, of course, is, is the white shark. And we know, based on research conducted all over the world, that the white shark is a major predator of pinnipeds, seals, and sea lions. So you, shoot, you show me high densities of those animals and you're gonna eventually get white sharks to show up to take advantage of that uh, foraging opportunity. And so we've been studying the white shark for the last decade here using, as I said, a variety of technologies. Um, and one of the things we're learning, and you saw the photos that St Steve showed of black tips piled up close to the beaches. Well, we've got these big predatory white sharks piled close to the beaches. This photo here, shot by the plane spotter pilot that we use is a white shark hunting literally within meters of the shoreline of these gray seals. And these gray seals are piled up very, very tight to the beach for obvious reasons. They don't wanna be consumed by white sharks. So that challenges these white sharks to get closer and closer to the beach in order to get to them. And so as a result, because Cape Cod is, draws tourists each and every summer and has for decades, we now have white sharks showing up to feed on seals. And it, all this overlaps with human activities, whether it be surfing or boogie boarding or kayaking or swimming. Uh, this has led to a high degree of overlap and uh, an increase in, in negative interactions between sharks and people in this region. So since 2012, we've had about a half a dozen interactions 
between sharks and people. Uh, three of them involved actual bites, and one was a fatal attack on a boogie boarder just two years ago. And so as a result, you know, it's, it's caused us to kind of change our emphasis to some degree and try to get a sense of how to minimize interactions of this nature. And, and the best way, of course, is to keep people out of the water. But what I've learned is people don't like to get out of the water in areas where there's high densities of seals and sharks. And so the potential exists. Now it's a really low probability event, as you all know, and the chances of being bitten by a shark extremely low. Nonetheless, it has uh, huge economic implications for the Cape Cod area when it happens. And the fatal attack two years ago was devastating. And so what we've decided to do is shift emphasis, start looking really closely at this predator-prey relationship. You know, how does the white shark attempt to kill the seal and how does the seal avoid being eaten by the shark? And how does this play out in, in shallow water next to Cape Cod? We feel that the more we know about this relationship, specifically where, when, and how it happens, the better equipped we're gonna to be to hopefully find patterns in behavior that we can share with the general public and with each uh, safety managers. And so for the last decade, we've been tagging using a, a number of technologies and we use a, a unique technique where we're not chumming the waters um, close to beaches. And I think that's the smart way to do things, you know? putting a bunch of chum in the water where people are swimming and recreating is not the way to go. So I use a spotter pilot, his name's Wayne Davis. Many of you have seen, I think some of this stuff on TV. Um, we have a, a, a small vessel that's fast, can travel great distances very quickly. And we have a pulpit on the end of uh, the bow of the boat. And you can see me standing on the pulpit. And what we do is we, the spotter pilot locates the shark. Uh, we then approach the shark. And because I'm way out on that pulpit, the, the shark doesn't know I'm there. So I'm able to just place an external tag at the base of the dorsal fin of the shark. And, and since we started doing this now, we've tagged, uh, I think the exact number is somewhere around two, 231 white sharks off the coast of Cape Cod, as well as off the coast of, of South Carolina. Um, and, and most of that technology has been looking at broad scale movements, but we've been using some of the newer uh, toys that are out there for scientists and, and Dean went over some of those and as well as Steve. Um, and so one of those is the, uh, the acoustic tag and it's been out there for, for a couple of decades, but what the acoustic tag does is it emits a very high frequency uh, ping. And so what we've done is wired up the coast of Cape Cod, Cape Cod Bay, and here you can see um, the acoustic receivers, these yellow dots. Anytime a shark swims within the range of one of these acoustic receivers, it's picked up and, and logged. So we can follow the individual movements of sharks and get a sense of when they arrive in Cape Cod, where they spend their time around Cape Cod, and when do they leave. So we can start to begin to answer some of these questions about residency, site fidelity, specific areas they might be targeting to harvest and kill seals, harvest and kill seals. And this technology is wonderful. As, as Dean alluded to, the, these tags can last up to 10 years. So as long as they stay on the shark, we not only can look at what the species is doing, but we can look at individuals and what they're doing. And what we're finding out since we've been using these tags for, for well over seven years is that the same sharks are coming back year after year after year and, uh, and using these areas. So what I've plotted out here is the seasonality of white sharks around the Massachusetts coastline. Each one of these white dots represents an acoustic receiver. And what you're going to see is that you'll see them start to swell and the size of them will be proportional to the number of detections, which gives us a sense of the number of sharks as well. And you'll see how this progresses through the season of 2019 and the data is up in the upper left hand corner. And so we're in, we're in June, the sharks begin to arrive in June in greater numbers as we get into uh, July. So now we're progressing into July. And again, those bubbles are starting to swell as the number of sharks increases. And what I want you to see is not only how the bubbles are changing in size as we get into August, but also um, the uh, um, where it's happening. You know, so we're getting the when and we're getting the where using this technology. And you can see that the outer Cape, you know, the, the, the eastern shoreline of Cape Cod 
is primarily where these sharks are occurring, but also in Cape Cod Bay along the eastern shore uh, of Cape Cod Bay and along the shoreline all the way up to Boston. But really the, the primary areas are along that outer Cape and that's because that's where we have the highest densities of seals. And as we get into December and really right about now is the time when the sharks are leaving. They're, they're out of here, the temperature's cool. And although this shark can elevate its internal body temperature, it does not tolerate the cold New England waters that we have here in the winter time. So we've kind of pinned down the distinct seasonality and we're getting a really good sense of where these sharks are spending their time. Um, so how do we figure out how the sharks are attacking and killing seals? And to do this, we can do it a number of ways. We can sit on our boat and watch the sharks all day and we've done that. And although we've done that for the last 10 years, we're out on the water as many as 30 or 40 times each season that the sharks are here, it's remarkable how rarely we see sharks actually successfully attack and kill seals. And so what we're doing now is using a couple of indirect methods and, and one that uh, the Save Our Seas Foundation has been sponsoring the last couple of years is using accelerometer technology with built-in camera tags. And a lot of researchers are using this these days to get a sense of really, really uh, fine scale behavior. Not what the sharks are doing, you know, uh, day to day, um, hour to hour, but really what they're doing minute to minute, second to second. So this tag that you see is actually a, a tow tag that has a built-in camera system, as well as a variety of sensors in it that measure, you know, some of the more basic parameters like temperature, depth, but also give us a sense of how that shark is moving through the water column. It's telling us the angles it's turning at, it's telling us how is accelerating in three dimensions, the direction in which it's going. We can derive tail beat frequency. We can really see how the shark is moving. We can tell how it's behaving every second. And some of these sensors are measuring many, many times per second. So we're getting millions of data points on how that shark is behaving at that moment. So we deploy these tags on the shark uh, for a day or two, up to three, four days. And then the tags are designed to come off. They float to the surface. We use uh, satellite transmitters and VHF transmitters to go get them. And then we can look at not only how that shark is behaving from a, a data point of view, but also correlate that with the actual video observations collected by the camera itself. And so what you see on this particular shark here is not only this towed camera tag, the accelerometry in it, but this is a long-term acoustic tag that I was referencing. This tag uh, will ping for nine and a half years. And if, as long as it stays on the shark, we'll learn about this shark long after this camera tag has come off. So what I'm gonna show you now is some uh, footage collected by one of these camera tags uh, on a shark that we, we just did this, uh, this track a few weeks ago. It was our our last deployment of, of one of these tags this season. We did eight this season, seven last season. And what I really like about this is you'll get a beautiful sense of, of how turbid our water is up here in New England, how challenging it is for these sharks to move into shallow water and attempt to kill seals. But also this little clip uh, has an actual predation event in it. Um, and what you'll see as the shark moves through the water, water and you can see how they barely make out the bottom uh, off to the right side of this shark. And what's going to happen is this shark is suddenly just going to accelerate and it's moving up into very, very shallow water where the surf is breaking and the camera is going to go all over the place. Um, you can see the surface of the water. You can see the bottom. The shark is in hot pursuit of a seal. Um, and as this happens so quickly and what we see in the day is giant spikes in acceleration in all three dimensions as this shark is attempting to kill the seal. What we're hoping to do is look at how frequently this happens over the course of a day, multiple days. How often is the shark successful so we can get a sense of where, when, and how these sharks are hunting these seals. Um, I've got students that look these, these uh, videos over and uh, you'd be surprised how often the shark does not successfully succeed in getting the seal. This particular shark missed the seal and you say to yourself, well, where was the seal? 
because of the turbid water around Cape Cod, um, what I did was I took a screen grab uh, of the seal itself and you can barely make it out right there. This shark is turning hard because this seal suddenly bolts to the left of the shark and the shark attempts to pursue it and fails and does not successfully uh, consume the seal. But we're starting to get these kinds of observations without having to sit on the water all day and watch for them. And we're starting to see, hopefully by looking at these data sets, how frequently it happens, how often they're successful, how many seals does a shark eat over the course of a season? Will that help to reduce the seal population over time? Because people in this area can, some, some aspects, complain about the presence of the seals. And we're hoping that uh, we can use these data to recreate the, the movements of the animal, much like what uh, Marianne was talking about. So what you see on the left side of this screen is data coming from the tag. And you've got the depth uh, on the top, you have the temperature, and then you've got uh, three different aspects of acceleration below that. What that allows us to do is recreate what this particular shark is doing during that event. Attempting to attack and kill a seal, but in this case, failing to do that, and then going off and, uh, and doing so again and again over the course of time. So uh, this is, these are the, the new kinds of toys that we're using. Uh, I could tell you <laughs> they didn't exist uh, not too long ago. And, um, and, it's, uh, and I can only imagine what many of you who are watching this and hope to become shark biologists as you get older, get, get to use when, you, when you're my age. Um, but with that, I will, uh, um, I will tell you to stay tuned. Uh, a lot of these data have yet to be analyzed. And, uh, and I'm more than happy to come back and share them with, with everybody again. So uh, thanks for your time and, and thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thank you for that. Wow, that was uh, that last like uh, little uh, seeing the shark on the grid uh, attacking the seal was, uh, it, it, it was incredible. So uh, th thank you for joining us. Thank you for that work. Uh, we're gonna open it up to questions now. I know we've had uh, several jumping through uh, in the chat throughout. So we're going to kind of go through and, uh, and and get back to some of those. So uh, first one is going to be for Dr. Grubbs. And this is, uh, from, oh, sorry, where did it go? Sorry about that. A uh, little technical difficulty here. My screen froze for a second. Okay, uh, first one is for Dr. Grubbs. This is from Kathleen. Do the oil toxins that you found from the Deepwater Horizon spill get deposited in fat stores in the sharks? Or uh, what are some of the ways that that has uh, affected uh, uh, the sharks you're studying in the Gulf? Uh, so good question. So the, the, um, the toxins can be accumulated in the muscle, in the liver, in a, in a number of different places. But um, just like uh, we do, they have the ability to uh, get, rid of, get rid of those toxins. And so essentially what we're doing is looking at um, markers that estimate how hard their body is working to get rid of those toxins. And so, you know, eventually you could reach a toxic load where the body just can't, can't offload them fast enough and it, and it comes at a, a physiological cost. And so we're mostly looking at uh, liver enzymes and, and things like that, that uh, uh, they are directly related to, um, to those, those specific toxins and looking at how they're, they're offloading them. But there is accumulation in the muscle and in the liver and in other organs as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I'd imagine with uh, sharks or most sharks, as you were saying, uh, being uh, towards the top of the trophic chain, top of the food chain, but some of them being in different spots of the food chain, uh, you see like different levels of that throughout as, as that, uh, as toxins from that oil accumulate throughout the, throughout the food, food web? Yeah, you would, you would think so. We, we, the, the, um, the, the species that we had the most samples for are all, all from similar tro trophic levels, but from different depths. They essentially fill the same niche at different depths, but, um, we we're also looking at bony fish. And one of the interesting things is that whereas all three of those shark species I showed reached a peak in their, in their um, 
you know, basically their accumulation and processing of those toxins at like three years, 30 months, 36 months after the spill. The bony fish that we're looking at, things like hakes and tile fish, they reached a peak at like 12 to 16 months after the spill. And so we interpret that that it took basically um, three years, you know, or two years beyond the, the smaller bony fish for it to work its way up the food chain to where those sharks were, were residing. Um, so yeah, definitely accumulates at different uh, concentrations, but also at different rates and timing. Hmm. Yeah, that'll be interesting to monitor over time. Uh, next question is for Dr. Kajura. This is from Mike. Uh, do black tips tend to stay in shallow waters uh, or just when they're migrating or uh, what's the relationship between water depth and the black tip sharks? Sure. Um, we see a lot of them down here in the, uh, in the shallows in, uh, in South Florida in the wintertime. And even as they're migrating north, they tend to stay fairly close to the shore. Uh, and I'm you know, why? I don't know. Maybe that's, you know, it's where their, their food is. And so that's probably why they're staying there and to stay out of the way of predators, you know, like the, the bigger sharks. Uh, that's probably another reason they're, they're hugging the shoreline. But uh, where one of the ideas was maybe they were hitching a ride on the Gulf Stream, you know, jumping on the Gulf Stream and, and you know, getting a ride north when they're migrating north. But it turns out that they're not really doing that. They're actually sticking basically along the shore all the way up. Um, and uh, you can see them in you know fairly shallow water as you know as you go uh, all the way uh, up the coast. <clears throat> and uh, does their uh, does their hitching a ride on the Gulf Stream tend to change like with uh, maybe there's upwelling or some other changes in in current as as you see temperature changing? Yeah, we we don't see them catching a ride like we thought. They're uh, they're doing it the hard way and actually mm -hmm. swimming their way north instead of uh, taking advantage of this current that's flowing in there. Um, you know, I don't know. I would have done it the lazy way, but that's just me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, some of us like a lazy river, some of us like a workout. Uh, <laughs> next question is for uh, Dr. Porter. Um, this is from Kathleen. Is the head tail separation uh, potentially useful for hunting in sharks? Uh, or do they have to, you know, hold their head stable while they hunt? Or uh, what is the relationship between uh, what you're studying and the way that sharks hunt? That's a really great question. And one of the things that's happening is the head is actually moving faster than the tail. And so um, we actually had to look back to the literature to the early 2000s. And Dr. Kajura actually talked about this in his dissertation on hammerhead sharks. He said they were yawing their heads. Um, he, he didn't really talk about how fast or compared to the tail, but he was able to talk about their electroreception. And so one of the things we think might be happening with the hammerheads are they're moving their head back and forth to kind of be sweeping and searching for prey. But one of the other cool findings we, we've just been writing about is the black tip sharks out in the wild also do this. So um, it seems like all sharks might have this this separation and in the literature there the examples of the animals that do this tend to be cartilaginous fish so maybe it's something weird about how um, a cartilaginous skeleton operates mechanically but um, it's that that paper just came out three years ago so it's a relatively new idea for me and hopefully I'll have some really good answers for you in like five more years but it's a uh, it's totally weird and I'm really excited to look into it more. Yeah, definitely. And I'm, it, it seems like the, the specific field of work you're in is, is very developing. And, uh, it, you know, it seems like you've always got some new uh, findings to present to us each time. So uh, looking forward to what's coming from that. Uh, next one, I got a, one for Dr. Skolmo here. Uh, how does the success rate of white sharks as predators compare to other, animal, uh, other uh, predators in the area? That's a great question. I, I wish I had a, an answer. Um, you know, you 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 would think based on the data set we've got so far. Now, granted, it's we're only talking about fourteen animals, so we're really just getting off the ground here. But you'd think that these these sharks starve to death um, because they're not succeeding that much based on what we've seen. But remember, we're just getting little snapshots um, from these animals. I mean, they're. They're out there for three, four months trying to feed on seals. And 
And you know, there are estimates that say that if they feed once, they don't have to feed for weeks. And so maybe their success rate is, is not very high by our standards, but might be is obviously sufficient by theirs. All my friends who use this technology uh, share the similar stories in that they, they spend hours and hours watching video with seeing very little. And um, so it's, it's somewhat rare to actually capture a predation event. And so rare such that, uh, you know, we really can't do any statistical modeling at this, at this stage. Um, so it's a great question. I'm hoping we can answer it, you know, in the coming years. But uh, as of right now, uh, it doesn't appear that they're as successful at feeding as, uh, or feed as frequently as uh, we tend to portray them as doing. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if we're measuring like, dramatic uh, <laughs> predation or something. <clears throat> Surely great white sharks in Massachusetts are, are, are up there, but uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting take on it. Um, I got a question for kind of uh, any of you, just as, since a, a lot of you are working in camera surveys, uh, what are some interesting findings from your camera surveys that may or may not be related to uh, the data you're trying to collect? Any uh, interesting findings? I remember I, I was working in the Aquatic Sciences Lab at UF a few years ago, and I, I got like great footage of a, a anhinga coming down to like swoop on a school of fish, and I was, it was like one of the most memorable things I saw. But it had absolutely nothing to do with what we were researching. So, are there uh, any interesting, uh, I guess, blooper reels from your camera surveys? I, did, I I can give one real quick, even though I didn't talk about camera surveys. We yeah. we were doing uh, we were doing some deep. Uh, deep water camera traps in the Gulf of Mexico, setting these deep water cameras from, that were baited uh, from about 1,500 feet deep down to about 3,000, 4,000 feet deep. And one of the first ones we dropped down, it was meant to be the camera facing out with a light, big light in front of it and everything. But I weighted the trap wrong and it landed, it landed on its side pointed straight up and when we picked it back up and it was at it was at 1700 feet deep and when we got it back and we downloaded the footage the first thing that showed up at 1700 feet deep was a huge manta ray just doing circles at 1700 feet deep over wow. our light we never expected that at that deep yeah i mean again yeah i i, I wouldn't know what to expect at that deep but <laughs> that, that would definitely catch me by surprise either way um Anybody else, any, uh, any good uh, blooper reel camera surveys? The only thing I would throw into the mix is that when we drop our block cams down to count sharks and, and prey fish abundance, uh, I found that puffer fish really are fascinated by the camera and they will just go bang, 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 and just sit there for like minutes at a time, just attacking the camera. And then, you know, they'll go away and they'll come back again. So I think the puffer fish are much more aggressive than the black tips. The black tips just swim by and don't care. Hmm. Uh, maybe if there's any uh, young aspiring scientists watching tonight, you can maybe do a research project about why are puffer fish so fascinated by the camera lens. Maybe there's some species of uh, uh, jellyfish or something that, that it reminds them of or, or something like that. Uh, so, you know, always, always getting our, our juices flowing, our, our, our brains pumping. Uh, another one for the panel. Uh, we're talking a lot about the sharks close to the shoreline. Um, and like Dr. Skomal had mentioned a couple of shark attacks and uh, we're talking about uh, the migration of thousands of black tip sharks right off of our shoreline. Um, are there any uh, like non-lethal or non-aggressive or non uh, really even confrontational interactions between people and sharks like scuba divers or boaters or uh, anything like that that you find in your research or in, in your just field work, not, not even necessarily research? I can, I can jump in real briefly yeah. down here. What we see is, uh, at least for the black tips, they're really skittish. And so if uh, when I'm flying over the aerial service, I see someone on like a paddleboard and you can see the sharks just sort of move away around them, just form a little halo. They don't like to be anywhere near the, uh, the people on the water. Um, and same thing with swimmers on the beach. You can see the sharks come up and then swim around them and just keep going. So uh, mm -hmm. for the most part, they, they tend to stay away from, from us big, clumsy, uh, noisy humans in the water. Hmm. Yeah, well, yeah. I always try to get video of uh, sharks when we're scuba diving. I try to go sit at the bottom and get the 
over, get the view of them going over. I'm like, can I get video from that to use? And most of the time I see like just the tail end of a shark swimming away from me. And it turns out I'm not as fast as them. So I can try to keep up, but it doesn't work very well. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I got a question here for Dr. Skolmo. Uh, the white sharks that you are studying, do they tend to prefer uh, seals at a certain stage of their life, uh, juvenile, adult, um, uh, mating? Uh, what, what is the relationship between the, the, uh, the life stages of the seal and the behavior of the sharks you said? Looks like Greg is still muted. Oh, whoops. <laughs> got, uh, who's holding the mute button? Yeah, sorry. Go. I, uh, I muted myself and I couldn't unmute myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it depends on the size of the shark. We've had uh, some of our five, six meter long sharks go after adult gray seals, which is really quite a challenge because those gray seals can weigh uh, six or 700 pounds. Um, but for the most part, they tend to target the more naive juveniles and even some of the, the young of the year pups. Gray seals are actually born in December and January. So coming up on their time when the, the young are, are, are born and uh, the pups uh, are separated from their, their mothers. And certainly by the time summer comes around, they're, they're independent, but they don't have a clue there's a big fish out there trying to eat them. And so they're the ones who typically get, 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 uh, get taken by uh, the white sharks. Uh, but also, you know, we will find carcasses from really large seals, like I said. So it really depends on how, how big you know, the shark is because the smaller, you know, three meter long sharks are, are not going to take on those adult gray seals. Yeah, I'd imagine, I mean, as we were talking before, sharks are going to eat, you know, whatever they can uh, get around. And if they're not going to get around on that, so, so that's a great way to look at it. Uh, I got to. The, uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention is it's the seals don't, don't just, uh, you know, give up. Um, we see a remarkable number of scars on the sharks um, from the seals themselves, bite marks as well as scratches. And so the seal doesn't just, uh, oh, okay, you got me, I'm, I'm done. They fight back and in many cases, the sharks will release them. Hmm. Interesting, that's kind of, I feel like this is, I've, I've heard similar things about alligators uh, as well, uh, but it could be mixed up on that, but just, uh, in, in general predatory. Well, I got a, another question, a really interesting one that just came through and I'm not sure uh, which of you might be best uh, to answer this. So anybody has an answer to this, please chime in. Is there anything that we're learning, anything new about sharks that we're learning uh, that could be potentially adapted to uh, human health? Like anything we learned about sharks and their physiology, uh, their behavior uh, that could be uh, maybe translated into medical research for humans? That's um, probably well suited for my research. Yeah. Um, so I study mineralized cartilage because that's what's found in the shark skeleton. And it turns out in humans, we don't want our skeleton or our cartilage to mineralize. We want our cartilage to stay nice and squishy. And when we do have mineralized cartilage, like um, in our knees or something, um, for example, that's usually a sign of aging or some sort of pathology. And one of the things we can do is start to think about the mechanics of mineralized cartilage and how that works, and also how cartilage mineralizes in and of itself. And um, another really interesting application to my work, um, at least with the cartilage and um, the shark skin is when we build robots, robots need to have just the right amount of like hardness and squishiness. Because one of the things that can happen if you want a robot to walk is if there's not enough squishy parts in your robot, it will walk around really stiff and fall over in only a few steps for, an exa for example. And so this cartilage is really interesting because it's similar to bone in a lot of ways and also similar to cartilage in a lot of ways. So it's a really cool material to think about for engineering purposes um, and as um, biomaterials relative to human health as you um, think about cartilage pathologies. 
or things that can go wrong with your cartilage. Excellent. Uh, so I know we're uh, kind of just about out of time here. I've got a great question from Shermaine here to close things on. Uh, how would you suggest somebody become a marine biologist? Like what do you feel like, uh, is there certain skills or something that any of you find, uh, what advice would you give to a young person who would like to become a marine biologist? Like what would be some initial steps for them to take uh, in their primary schoolwork? Uh, we can go around if we want, uh, Dr. Porter, if we want to, if you have any advice for any aspiring marine biologists. Yeah, um, I'm actually a native Arizonan, so I'm from the desert. And one of the things that I always tell students is you want to take advantage of opportunities that are near you and opportunities that are accessible to you. And so if a really great opportunity to start working as a scientist or do some sort of camp, don't say no because it's not specifically marine biology. Say yes, take advantage of that opportunity because it will help you become a scientist. And while we all study sharks, probably the most important thing about what we do is we are scientists. And so if you can get that really good background and show that you are a scientist and show that you are becoming a scientist, that's like a, a great way to open up a lot of doors for yourself. And so um, just to tell everybody, my very first publications, my very first scientific publications are on pine trees. I started off as a plant ecologist. So don't think that because you take advantage of one opportunity, it will close doors. Saying yes to opportunities will only open doors for you. That's great advice. Uh, anybody have anything to add to that? Dr. Scomo, any advice for uh, aspiring marine biologists? Well, I think that Marianne put it really well. You know, I, uh, some of my first work was on pond fishes. Um, you know, realize when you're going through school, I know you, you may love sharks and you want to focus on sharks, but what you want to learn is different tool sets. That's what it's all about, you know? So don't skimp on, on coursework and it may not have anything to do with, uh, with sharks. And, and I particularly want to emphasize the need to learn quantitative skills. And I think that's critical, particularly more so now than when I was in college. So that's what it's all about. And volunteer, you know, that, it worked for me and it worked for a lot of people that I know in the field. Uh, Dr. Kajura, any advice for aspiring marine biologists? Uh, my colleagues have said a lot. Um, the only thing I would add is communication is really important, right? You need to know the material, you know, study, but be able to write well. Um, and uh, be able to communicate your findings. That's really the end result of science. Uh, not only writing, but also public speaking, you know, going to conferences and, and talking about your ideas, that's going to be important as well. So don't skimp on things like English or you know, the courses like that, that you might not want to take. It's not a science course, no, but it's critical to be able to communicate your, uh, your, uh, your findings to the public. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you'll have to have skills in many different uh, areas to be uh, you know, an expert in anything, I feel like. So that's great advice. Uh, Dr. Grubbs, anything to add to that? Well, I mean, these guys have really covered a lot of, of what I would have said as, as well. But uh, so I'll just add, just to follow up on what Greg said, just take every math course you can possibly get your hands on, take every statistics course when you get older that you can get your hands on and every science course and also uh, Steve brought up a, a great point, learning to write. I mean, if you can, you can learn to write uh, really early before you even considering a career. If you learn to write, that will benefit you for the rest of your life, no matter what you go into. Absolutely. All great advice. And thank you again to our panel, Dr. Dean Grubbs, Dr. Stephen Kajira, and Dr. Marianne Porter, and Dr. Gregory Skolmel for our Shark Expert panel discussion. Uh, presented by the Save Our Seas Foundation. Thanks again for making all this possible. And thank you to everyone who joined us. Uh, I actually had one more question come to me in the chat. Uh, someone asked me what type of shark is behind me. This is a megalodon uh, on diorama, not a real megalodon, but a life-size <laughs> model of a megalodon on display at the Museum of Discovery and Science. 
you can come see it starting this weekend. We'll be reopening weekends in December, uh, leading up to our full reopening on our New Year's Eve celebration. So uh, if you'd like to learn more about this and stop by and see our Save Our Seas shark cart, uh, to see some specimens and, and get up close and, and, and ask some more questions, uh, come on by and see us. Uh, we'll be there weekends in December and then beyond that. But thank you again to our expert panel. Thank you again to the Save Our Seas Foundation for making this possible. And thank you to all of us, to all of you that joined us this evening. I'm Brady Newbill with the Museum of Discovery and Science, signing off. We'll see you again soon. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys.